Hey, we're going to talk some fantasy with Field Yates of ESPN's Fantasy Focus podcast, uh, which is terrific. And the motivation behind this is on Thursday, Yahoo is going to do a league with Simmons and I and other Ringer employees. We're going to do a live draft on Thursday. So I need to prep. I need to get back in this deal. And Field is great. So excited to talk to him. So let's get to it. So I was looking at all the draft averages. I was looking at your rankings. I've actually done a lot of prep on this. I've been listening to it. multiple fantasy pods, just trying to get a gauge of where everything's at right now. Yeah. Um, and we're getting ready for our Thursday deal. So McCaffrey is the clear no-brainer. If you have the number one pick, there's there's no argument to go with anyone else, considering what he had 100 more points in scoring last year than any other running back. Yeah, you know, I tell people this frank, uh, frequently. is like fantasy football does have some elements that kind of like mirror economics in the market, right? And so like, Think of this as supply and demand. There are just not going to be nearly as many game-changing running backs in fantasy football as there will be wide receivers, which inherently makes the value of a top-tier running back that much greater. And he was so much better than the field last year. Like Even Brees Hall having this incredible receiving season and having nearly 1,600 total yards, and McCaffrey was still that much better. Uh, we did this project this year, which when I say it, like it makes me sound like I have less of a life than I already acknowledge that I do. We did 35 mock drafts. It's kind of like an ESPN fantasy staff this summer, uh, plus some of the ones that I had been doing just like other leagues or just even like a little bit of prep myself. Uh, and McCaffrey went uh, first in all but one of them. So and I'm talking about like 40 to 50 total mock drafts. He has gone first in every single one of them. And the only time he didn't was when somebody was like, I just want to mix, mix things up a little bit. So I'm taking CD Lamb. Okay, so that was the only other scenario where somebody went with a non McCaffrey pick. Yeah, and, and in the Lamb, simulations, like, right? I, I have like you know, I've talked. I, I could talk like if I was you know if we were in court, I could make the case for Ceedee Lamb, uh, Brees Hall, maybe Bijan Robinson, maybe Tyreek Hill. But it's almost like you're, you're paying a premium on players that you could likely get. Like if you're inclined to take Ceedee Lamb first overall, you might just offer the number one pick to the guy at number two and see if that person prefers. Christian McCaffrey, and then trade your first and second round pick for their first and second round pick and get CeeDee Lamb and whatever one player ahead in the back end of the second round would be. Okay, so when I think about the running back position, because we'll stay here, you know, back in the day, there were just so many different ones that you could go with. I mean, that was kind of the strength of your team is if you have yeah. a great number one and a really good number two, you had a great chance of winning your league. But because of how the game has changed and when you start looking at the total scoring from this position, it's like you wonder how deep you can go. So who do, who do you have as your top five running backs right now? And then let's try to get to that cutoff point of now you're in trouble. Yeah, I just say there's a line. So the first five in this order, Christian McCaffrey, Brees Hall, Bijan Robinson, who are all in like the top six overall. So like regardless of position, those are three of my top six players. Next up, and I flip flop on these two guys, which is I'm saying that not to like take myself off the hook if one of them outperforms the other, but more to suggest just how close they are. Um, is Saquon Barkley and Jonathan Taylor, like two guys who have been the top of the fantasy heap at the top of the fantasy heap in the past. Those guys are four or five. Then you get into Kyron Williams, Jameer Gibbs, Isaiah Pacheco, Derrick Henry is kind of like the first nine where I feel really good about those guys, either because what they've already done, what they are set up to do this year. Like even in the case of Derrick Henry, we talk about age all the time for running backs. It feels like the stars have aligned to be in Baltimore. Uh, and play in an offense that, not to get nerdy, but this is a fantasy football podcast, or at least a conversation about fantasy football with yeah, your just podcast today. is like, yeah, just today. Um, <laughs> like, what, like for, for Derrick Henry, he's used to, like, we love, like, uh, stacked box talk, right, on, uh, on, on any podcast we can find. Like, he's used to seeing eight men in the box all the time, right, in Tennessee when they had such a low volume and, frankly, like, not that scary passing attack surrounding him, especially after A.J. Brown got traded, where in Baltimore... Well, Lamar has never had like this super dynamic number one wide receiver for fantasy purposes during his time as the starter. He's led the NFL in passing touchdowns during his time in Baltimore. He's a two-time MVP. Like if you're just going to key on Derrick Henry, Lamar is going to win the MVP again this season. So he's in a really good spot. So those first nine, I feel good about. Then you get into a territory of Alvin Kamara, Travis Etienne, a few others. I think the number is close to like 17 or 18 running backs. And then all of a sudden, you can easily talk yourself out of those players. And there's like a general sense of where that takes place. It would be Aaron Jones, now in Minnesota, after being cut, Ramondre Stevenson, James Conner, um, Zach Moss, who if you're optimistic that like Cincinnati will make him the starter, you're kind of like, 
I, I, I like the player. I don't love the player or the situation. So if you play in a smaller league, it's more likely that a lot of the teams have two good running backs. You're prioritizing those backs early. If you're playing in a 16-team league, just by volume, the sheer number of teams that are going to be guaranteed two good starting running backs is lower. So you can be a little more unique at the top of the boards. But those running backs start to get scary in a hurry. Look, well, I used to play all the time, and I had a league with my buddies back home. And my problem would be I watched on Saturday, hey, this guy is good. Yeah. And that's just not what the game is. You can think about the scoring opportunities. So there are times when I'm like getting ready and thinking about it because it's only been like the last couple of years um, that I that I haven't had any kind of team or haven't been in the league at all. But like I'll look at Bijan, right? Like everybody yeah. loves Bijan, and I promise that this podcast episode will not be why did you do this? Why did you do this for forty minutes? But you have Bijan, I believe, third in your yeah. running back rankings. He was ninth in scoring last season, but it's this constant, and we'll do it when we get to Drake London and the receivers too. It's this, I, everybody's on the same page with this, this hope. This, it, it's the most optimistic anyone has ever been about a group of skill guys in that post-coaching change in Cousins being in Atlanta that Bijan and Pitts and London are all going to go off now. And look, Bijan is one of the most talented running backs we've seen come out, but to have him third, how much of that is just him I mean, it just seems to be complete faith that it can't be as bad as we just saw. Yeah, I think the baseline that he is working from last year at the quarterback spot is like not like bad. It's like maybe, you know, as bad in, as there was in the NFL last season, other than perhaps the Jets, maybe the Patriots. Like, I mean, I guess there were a handful of teams that had really, really bad quarterback play last year. But Atlanta, like we, we have a very well-established threshold of like what Kirk Cousins offenses will look like. The ceiling is probably not, top three or top five, but the floor is probably like a league average offense. So they're going to have way more trips to the red zone this year. And because of reasons that I, I would argue like are, are illegitimate, Bijan had two carries last year inside the five yard line, two. And I know that Tyler Algier is a good serviceable player, but at some point, like even if it wasn't you that made the call, it wasn't you that was coaching when he was the eighth overall pick, like you have to just recognize that it's going to have to be Bijan more than any other player on the offense. And I hear you on the idea of like everybody is like all of a sudden bouncing back on Bijan and Drickland and Kyle Pitts. But that have, number field, that that number is so absurd. That's an impossibility that that number will mirror what just happened. So there's like you're a right. fullback who probably has, like, there's probably a defensive player who had more goal to go carries last year than Bijan, right? Um, but I am not, so I, I have like tepid expectations for Kyle Pitts again this year. So I've kind of felt like, because I do think at some point you can't just say like, it was really bad. They add Kirk Cousins and they change coaches and everything becomes like elite across the board. I think there's room for two stars in this offense and I'm banking on it being Bijan and Drake. That's where I have settled personally. Okay. okay. Why isn't Jameer Gibbs going top five on average? Probably just because he's got more competition. Like if you're talking about sheer number of snaps he's going to play this year and more snaps equals more opportunities, he has probably the best co-starter or a backup running back in the NFL, right? David Montgomery is a starter on quite a few teams. And while Gibbs really picked up down the stretch in terms of his like red zone and goal line utilization, if they get the ball, like if they throw a bomb to JMO, Jamison Williams, and he catches it at the, at the eight yard line and is dragged down at the one, and they don't have to like hurry up to the ball to snap it. I think David Montgomery is coming on the field. Like, that's my guess. And if that happens, like if there are opportunities where they have goal to go situations three, four, five, six times throughout the year and they have their choice of who gets the football, it's going to be David Montgomery. Whereas if you go to other backs that are drafted just ahead of him or right behind him, like even Isaiah Pacheco in Kansas City going behind Jameer Gibbs, uh, they're, they're going to be the guy at the goal line. They just are. Um, so that's probably like there are only so many things you could make the argument against Jameer Gibbs for, but that's probably the strongest bet is sheer volume and David Montgomery being a bigger back. Right. I mean, Gibbs is still going on average on the ESPN drafts. It, it's 6.5. So it's not like he's he's going yeah. ninth or something and I'm outraged by the whole thing. But I think there's an argument to be made of like the optimistic side of Bijan versus what Jameer already did in the first year. But at the same time, like this is kind of going back to my original thing is like, as much as we all like Jameer Gibbs, like Bijan was once a generational talent running back. So yeah. there's just no way that he can't. And I think that's why you're seeing him 
projected number three, uh, both on your projections and the overall staff projections going up there now. You know this too, like, uh, like, and not to, to sidetrack to basketball for a second, but like, obviously you're all in on the, on the draft and you know it, like, I know that everybody loves like, Hey, I want to know exactly where like, so-and-so like, you know, where's Kyle Filipowski on your, like, you know, one to 50 big board. Like you have him 27th. I had him 23rd. Like that's wild. You had him 27th or whatever. <laughs> yeah, 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 but right, it's, right. I, I say this all the time. Like I think of players in fantasy as tiers, right? It's our buckets, whatever you want to call them. So like when I have Jameer Gibbs, I did like, you know, Christian McCaffrey probably is a tier unto himself. I expanded it a little bit to three running backs, but like sometimes when you're sitting there and you're like, gosh, this guy's like, the fifth running back off the board, and that guy's the eighth. Like, that sounds like a big difference, but I'm kind of saying the same thing, which is, like, I have zero qualms if that guy's the number one running back on your team, and you should feel great about him every single Sunday. It's Again, this is not to, like, skirt responsibility if I get my picks wrong. It's more to suggest to people that there's so many times, like, I get questions on Sunday morning where it's like, you know, am I starting this guy or that guy? And I'm like, like, I, I flip a coin, right? Like, uh, my, my job, I don't have like the, this crystal ball. That's not what a fantasy analyst is. It's to take as much information as we have and try to present it in like a neat and tidy way. But like a lot of times, like I'm talking to like my brother who's like, you know, got three kids and him and his wife work full time. So he's not sitting there during the week, like closely studying the uh, Jaguars practice report. So he doesn't know if like Christian Kirk's Q next to his name is like an actual Q or if he's like, hey, just a little bit dinged up and he's going to play. Like uh, Most of the time, people are looking for confirmation more so than they are looking for like a clear-cut answer between Terry McLaurin and Tyler Lockett in Week 8 based off their projections. Yeah, I mean, as much as I still listen to Sports Talk Radio, I would tell you that my least favorite content <laughs> in the world is the rapid-fire calls. Be like, all right, I have Givens and Frisman Jackson in one wide receiver <laughs> spot open. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, uh, that's a like why right did there? Yeah. yeah. All right. Okay. So this this is good then because let's get a quick Saquon thing in here because this also leads into the Hertz conversation. Where Hertz is still going to go top five as far yeah. as quarterbacks are concerned. So I don't want to go all quarterback right now, but there is a fascinating like, well, does Hertz hurt Barkley? Because yeah. I don't think they're going to stop doing the most successful single play in the NFL with the uh, tush push, whatever you want to call it. Yeah. But at the same time, like a healthy Barkley, like it's just going to be hard to pass on the idea of him being pissed and him being like ready to go. And I would say even without Kelsey feeling better about the offensive line, I mean, I don't know what you would say. Well, basically I would say it's not even about an offensive line conversation between the Giants and the Eagles, especially when you look at the health of the Giants over the years, but not having any fear whatsoever about getting beat down the field or on the outside. Yeah. So even if you're you're trying to figure out the math of how many touchdowns is Barkley going to take from Hertz, or is Hertz just going to still keep all of his, the field must it it the default of this is that at least there's other threats that Saquon has around him that he's not had with the Giants. Totally, it's like you got set, you got two separate gravitational forces. I'll I'll throw one more kind of into that argument you made about the rushing touchdowns because it's legit. Like if they have the ball, I was talking about how if the Lions have the ball first and goal from the one, like and they're handing the ball off to a running back, it's probably David Montgomery over Jameer Gibbs. For the Eagles, it's just let the quarterback just do what he does, which is be the best short yardage runner in the NFL. Um, and beyond that, if you look at Jalen Hurts so far in his career, and this tracks with a lot of guys who have been very, very good uh, rushing quarterbacks, they don't tend to throw the football off, throw the football to running backs as much because quarterback scrambles sort of offset dump off to the back, right? Like Brady or like even still in Tampa, like, Baker Mayfield, not a very mobile quarterback, but dumps the football off all the time, which is why Rashad White had this monster receiving season last year. By the way, that's a, that's a positive of Baker's game. It's not a negative. It's like good decision making. Um, so you have the idea that Saquon probably won't be as involved in the passing game and the fact that he might not have as many rushing touchdowns from short yardage working against the fact that it's, I don't know, if it's not the best offensive line in football, it's a decidedly better offensive line than anything he ever played behind in New York. And we've seen over the past couple of seasons, like Miles Sanders was like the third leading rusher in the NFL two years ago and had like a big touchdown season. Jalen Hurts can get his and the best running back in Philadelphia can get his as well. And maybe this is like too much of a narrative, but like, I don't think the Eagles paid all this money for a team that has totally devalued the running back position during Howie Roseman, their GM's tenure to have Saquon come in and be like, you know, just a part of the running game. He should yeah. be the focal point, the entirety of it. Yeah, I mean, it's a brand new toy, and I would think you'd want to show it off there a little For bit. Sure. Okay, let's talk wide receivers because we still have a lot of work to do here. Um, give me your quick top five, 
And then I think there's like a big lingering question that I did some research on. So I'm excited about. So I know yeah. your five is a little different because it sounds like CD's the consensus one and you just flipped him with Tyreek, right? Yeah, I flipped him with Tyreek recently. And this is sort of a hedge right now. I, I sort of own this is that like if CD Lamb doesn't have a contract and it's August 28th as opposed to August 5th when you and I are talking right now, like at some point the possibility of him missing a game is there, right? And the Cowboys have gone down this road before. They famously did it with Zeke, who got the contract done like right before uh, week one. He was back on the field, then it was fine. Um, but we've seen these contract holdouts become a real trick for these wide receivers. Brandon Ayuk, CeeDee Lamb, still unsettled as of this moment. And it's not like Tyree Kill is like some slouch, right, obviously. But uh, CeeDee Lamb, if he got signed tomorrow, would flip back up. Because if you look at his last 11 games last season, it's like historically ridiculous 134 targets in his final 11 games last year which that's a good number for a full season he did it in what two-thirds of a season so Tyreek CD I have Amon Ross St. Brown third which is different than where a lot of people land Jamar Chase Justin Jefferson who remind me of Saquon Barkley and uh, Jonathan Taylor in the sense that you could flip a coin on those guys Uh, Chase has a much better quarterback situation Jefferson has been largely quarterback proof and Sam Darnold or JJ McCarthy might be enough in an offense that kind of kept things moving last year with like Jaron Hall and Nick Mullins under center. Okay. So let's get to the Chase Jefferson conversation. And actually this research is from your latest episode. So hey, yo. um, you'll be familiar with it, but I thought that this was really telling because like you could feel a certain way about Chase and now you're thinking about Jefferson post cousins. Like how could you even make a debate? I mean, I personally like Chase better, yeah. but um, I know most people would tell me that I'm wrong and that's totally fine. But when you look at Jefferson with cousins, he's wide receiver number three without cousins. He was wide receiver number eight. Chase with Burrow was wide receiver number seven without Burrow wide receiver number 34. That kind of ends the debate of who you're going to take if they're both, if, if the other guys are gone and those two options and you want a receiver, I don't know how you take chase based yeah. on that, right. knowing that it's still you know, a huge question mark about what's going to happen with a quarterback, because it seems like with Jefferson it's not going to matter. Yeah. That's fair um, because and, and if, if like Joe Burrow wasn't available, if you're concerned about Joe for some reason, like you would definitely right, fall towards the other part of it. Right. Jefferson. So. But yeah, I mean, I would say this, too, is that like I do look at the circumstances of the games in which Jefferson was without Kirk Cousins as opposed to when Jamar Chase was without uh, Joe Burrow. Like Cincinnati, uh, like not to get too much into like, you know, uh, environments and land and like uh, nature and, uh, and 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 like uh, being the local meteorologist but like Cincinnati playing in like cold weather games grinded out games because their defense was good like did it need did not need Jamar Chase to like have a bunch of vertical shots down the field like he just they totally changed their offense with Jake Browning like Joe is not going to be confused for Josh Allen as far as like strongest arm in the NFL but can certainly push the football down the field and the Bengals just didn't do that once Jake Browning took over it was pretty much all like at the line of scrimmage for Jamar Chase so he had some high volume games but they were not nearly as likely to see him go for 150 yards because unless he breaks a bunch of tackles, it probably wasn't happening. But this kind of comes down to like, again, the idea of if we were in court and I told you, you had to be the Jefferson guy and I had to be the chase guy, we'd both feel really good about our case. Yeah. Cause I, I think there's, um, I mean, you're seeing Burrow take this hit now, too, with where he's being drafted, the names that I'll hear him about. But then again, yeah. you got to get back and remember the scoring, and that's what will lead to some of the conversation about the QBs. But let's uh, let's stay in the receivers here because yeah. what do you do with the rookies? Because there's good – there's actually pretty solid history that we're talking the elite, elite first-rounders, the rookies. They're worth taking higher than the more established guys that maybe are always wide receiver number two. Or I shouldn't say wide receiver number two. I shouldn't maybe the number two option on a team with all of the skill guys and be like, well, at least this guy's been playing four or five years. I know exactly what I'm getting as opposed to rookies. But history tells us these top flight guys deliver immediately. Yeah, at some point you start to like you, you have to use process of elimination when you're trying to find guys that aren't like unimpeachable top seven or eight wide receivers, but are like pretty close with a question mark or two. And as I look through Marvin Harrison Jr., the only question, and I have him as wide receiver nine, which when you uh, look at my, the rest of my colleagues at ESPN, I haven't tracked every single person, but uh, he uh, outside outside of ESPN, but his average rank amongst my colleagues is thirteen point three. So 4.3 slots, when you're talking about guys within the top 15 at any position, that's a big gap. So I have a wide receiver nine, and like the only question mark that I suppose you could ask for Marv is, can he get it done at the NFL level? I mean, you watch tons of college football, and you have known this player probably since his high school days. Like, yes, the answer is yes. And 
not just because of what we've seen, but because of what you alluded to, like rookie wide receivers coming out of the gates and being stars is a totally normal thing. We see it almost every single year. Pukunakua, obviously, last year was the best. Garrett Wilson a couple of seasons ago. Jamar Chase, Justin Jefferson, the list goes on and on and on. Um, it's a really good opportunity for Marvin Harrison Jr. He is the clear-cut number one wideout for a team that I'm not going to do a Kyler debate right now. I think Kyler is good. How's that? Like, I think he's good enough that he can get the football to Marvin Harrison Jr. a lot, like maybe between 8 and 10 targets a game. And they are going to be, I think, an improved team, but I still think they could be fourth in their own division. They might have to throw the football a lot. So all those things make me feel really good about Marvin Harrison Jr. Weirdly having a high floor as a rookie, which is something that you don't normally say about rookies because of the fact that they have not, at the NFL level, had the chance to do it before. Uh, you've got Drake London um, as part of this Atlanta <laughs> reinvention 2.0 here. But, yeah. I mean, the reality, too, is when you look at his target numbers, they're just not very high. He's not top 20 in targets. Um, so where do you have London? Yeah, he's, I think, 13 for me now, 13, 14, which is right in that, you know, that, that's not that far off. from. So it's like Marvin Harrison Jr. for me, Devontae Adams, Chris, uh, Mike, Michael Pittman Jr., Chris Olave, and then Drake London. Uh, he, yeah, it's, it's, So he's ahead of Neighbors and a Dunze for you? He is, yeah. And those guys, and we can talk about Neighbors, you know, Dunze just because of the, the, the depth there, right? I mean, he could be their third best wide receiver in time. He won't be. But uh, with Keenan Allen and DJ Moore aboard, it's not crazy to think he'd be number three in the pecking order uh, there. But um, with Drake, it's like that he probably will feel the quarterback impact the most, right? Because Bijan, like, you know, even if Mariota and Desmond Ritter weren't good players, like, it's not that hard to turn around and hand the football off to your running back, right? It does change the way the teams play defense against you. But for London, you know, 900 plus receiving yards last year and two touchdowns. Him and Chris Godwin were the only two players to reach at least 900 yards and have two or fewer touchdowns. Um, Eighth overall pick, you remember, you remember his USC days, obviously. He was the offensive player of the year in the then Pac-12, and he got hurt on Halloween, which is what? That's like maybe 65, 70% of the way through the college football regular season. That's how dominant of a player he was uh, during his final season there. So I still have, like, I continue to just, like, trust that this guy coming out was or is who I thought he was uh, in Atlanta now. So I am banking on, like, way more volume from one of the least past heavy offenses to probably one of the more past heavy offenses. If we assume the system is what Zach Robinson, their new OC coached under Sean McVay with in LA, or at least very close to it. So Drake London is, I mean, sometimes the chalky picks are boring, um, but he is one of the chalkier like breakout picks in this year's uh, not just wide receiver group, but really any player at any position. See, these are good, like battling theories in that, like, would you rather have Rome? as the potential three, although just the idea of you saying that sentence, because I love him so much, I'm like, yeah. well, that's, that's not going to be real. Yeah. Um, and who knows? I mean, Keeney could get hurt again. And then you have Caleb Williams, a quarterback, as opposed to what Neighbors is dealing with, even though he's going to be the guy that you're looking at every single time yeah. down the field. Um, I think another one of those, it's not the same theory, but the similar theory of like, would you rather have the clear number one option or would you rather have a really strong number two? Because clearly Stefan Diggs, yeah. who... If you look at it, last year was ninth in scoring. I guess the bloom is off the rose a bit with him. Yeah, it is. He's he's being projected to go around twenty, and I don't know if that's because you think Nico takes away from his scoring. But again, it kind of gets back to is Diggs less of an option now because he's not the clear number one, or should he still be? Is twenty just too low for him? Considering hey, there's actually somebody else on the other side that's a real option here, yeah. especially yeah, when you look at the depth of Houston in general. I've become sort of the, the, the Diggs guy amongst ESPN rankers. A lot of people have Nico Collins ranked ahead of him now, which is not like some crazy thought. Um, the question I would have, and I'm, I, I'm not asking this rhetorically, I'm asking it seriously, is like Nico Collins had 120 targets last year. Like, Do you think personally there's like a, factoring in the addition of Stephon Diggs and the health now of Tank Dell, who missed a good chunk of last season, like, do you yeah, I mean, he Nico missed Collins he missed almost, be, well, not half, but yeah, I mean, Tank, job, we yeah. I should have brought him up earlier, so yeah. maybe that is baked into it even more, that it's not just the other guy, it's Tank as well. So go ahead. Yeah, it seems like uh, Nico, like, probably, like, I don't expect him to jump from, like, 120 to, like, 150 targets this year. Do you? Um, No, I, I wouldn't think, I, I don't think they would want to be that predictable. I mean, what's yeah, the whole point of bringing too. Diggs in? Yeah. So I feel that way too. And so I think Diggs could, I think Diggs will lead the team in targets. And I think the number will be less than where it has been in Buffalo, which is like 
close to 160 to 170 per season over those four years. The number went up, obviously, when they go to 17 games. Um, and it could be maybe like 130 for Diggs, 135, which is still a big number, but that's why you get a bit of a Diggs discount. Is I, I would also say this, is that Nico Collins might have more games where he leads the Texans in receiving yards. Maybe he has the most games with 100 receiving yards amongst all Texans. I think Diggs, though, is going to just chew up targets. I'm not trying to make this so reductive, but if the Texans didn't feel like Diggs was still a very capable player who could fill a specific role, they wouldn't have traded for him. It wasn't a huge package they traded for him, but you know, for a guy, for a team that is about to become really, really expensive, like to acquire Stephon Diggs did require like some future planning and also like tightening the screws on other spots around the roster financially this year. I thought it was a sign that they feel like he could be the guy that kind of unlocks the next level for an offense that was really good last year when we all thought, at least I thought it was going to be really, really bad. Yeah, look, I know he slowed down a bit. I know he's not for everybody. He always seems to be upset after a certain amount of time, but he'll be, what, 31 this season? I On mean, a one-year deal. Uh, like, you think he's right, going to go down there right. and, and pout? Like, he's going to go down there, play with well, probably... Yeah, he, he, might still might do, yeah. he might he still might pout. do that. But he's playing with the quarterback that, like, not obviously not Mahomes, but like he's on the short list, I would think CJ Stroud of the guys that like players around the NFL now want to play with. They All just right, based on that guy, looking at the scoring last year for quarterbacks, top five in scoring: Allen, Hurts, Dak, Lamar, and Jordan Love. Yep. Um, a couple different That's things that I'm crazy. looking at here. G- yeah. Give me your give me your top five right now for 24. Uh, so this is where I, I've probably generated the most pushback, but uh, it is Josh Allen. No debate there. Jalen Hurts, Anthony and Allen's Richardson. like no debate, right? It's no that debate. far and away. Okay, all right. I mean, even in the last eight games when both Stephon Diggs and Gabe Davis were up and down, Josh was just so far. I mean, he's just, he's literally, I mean, he's unbelievable. He's so good in every way that you need him to be good. For fantasy purposes, highest scoring player in the league each of the past two seasons. Uh, Anthony Richardson, three. Uh, Patrick Mahomes for Lamar Jackson, five. Richardson, obviously the one that people have been asking about a ton. Um, I'll be honest with you, like, I, I'm super optimistic about the player. Uh, just as like the the raw skill set, I know you know it, but like for as freaky as some of these guys like Josh and, and Jalen are at like physically, like Richardson might be just like a touch freakier, right? Six foot five, two hundred and forty four pounds at a four 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 forty, like that's ridiculous. He played twelve quarters last year, twelve, and he still had four rushing touchdowns. Like the guy has all the right ingredients to be a fantasy superstar, even if he's not a perfect passer right out of the gates. Jalen Hurts had 16, 16 passing touchdowns his first season as a starter, which in today's NFL is nothing. And he was still like one of the five best quarterbacks in all of fantasy football. Um, it's not going to require Anthony Richardson to become this surgeon as a thrower overnight to be a fantasy superstar. And yeah, I'm optimistic on the player. Is it a leap of faith for sure? But uh, I just think that we, it's, I mean, if I had if I'd told you I was quarterback three on Jalen Hurts a few years ago, people would have said you're nuts. So sometimes you got to get ahead of the curve. Okay, I think it's insane. Fair. <laughs> not the only person that's told me that. Uh, and you're not, in, you're not like completely on your own with this one because his average draft position is what, around five or six? Like yeah, I, I've heard yeah. other people say that, and <laughs> here's what I would offer up. Yeah. I understand that it's different with the scoring. Yeah. And that the rushing touchdowns are really attractive. But what I saw, and I went back and watched him this morning, is I see somebody that doesn't trust throwing at all. And yeah. he is so gifted. And I don't think the teams are entirely ready for it. Three, I think the four touchdown runs are on draws that are defended Yeah, they are. They horribly. love the quarterback run. Yeah. Right. And at some point, you'd think the other team goes, we've got to keep someone in. And look, he still may win the one-on-one with a linebacker spying him anyway, because he sure. is that gifted. And there's there's no debate on it. But if I'm sitting there again, we're just talking about fantasy, but the names that you're putting him ahead of after playing 12 quarters just because of the rushing part, which again, I still think like the rushing element is is really exciting, but it scares me when it feels like it's your default comfort setting and he hasn't played enough for that. Like is all of a sudden now he's going to feel like, oh, I don't have to go to this. I think he went to that stuff because they were really worried about the limitations of anything else they could try to do with him. Yeah, it's a tricky one. It's fair. Uh, so when I'm ranking, I think there's like a little bit of a different methodology in certain portions of the rankings. Like I feel good at the top of the board about imagining the upside of the player, right? Uh, It's not, if if, if I'm just looking for the floor of a guy, my one through 10 would feel differently. When I get to like 
maybe like RB15 to RB25, I am much more mindful of the floor and not just the upside because that position can get ugly in a hurry, as I was talking about earlier. But for the quarterbacks, like the idea here with Richardson is Lamar's unbelievable. He's actually weirdly been the player that I've gotten the most pushback, like, hey, you should have Lamar ahead of Richardson. Over the past, if you go look at the last three seasons in which Lamar has been the NFL's MVP during one of them, I look at like 20 points as an arbitrary high-scoring week for a quarterback. If you go back and look at the number of games in which Lamar has scored at least 20 points, and I, I had, of course I had this written down. I don't have the piece of paper that I had it written down on. The number is a lot lower on like a percentage basis than you might expect. Lamar has been, even by his own standards, like a little bit more up and down over the past three years than you might realize as a fantasy quarterback. So another reason why Josh Allen is so unique is because he's so darn consistent in that regard. But that's my idea with Richardson. is like the possibility of every single week because of the rushing upside to get the 20 points might be as high as any quarterback not named Josh Allen or Jalen Hurts. I would argue it is as high as any quarterback not named those two guys. Okay. Let's talk about this poor guy, Mahomes. Um, <laughs> his average, what, his average draft position is worth seven or eight right now? Uh, I think it's higher than that. I think it's up to like quarterback four. I, have, I can pull you Oh, it is? Right yeah, it's, it's okay. Mahomes' name's value, like, I'm surprised it's actually not higher than that. Like for a while and you know, value-based drafting, like think about like running backs in the real NFL draft going like top 10. Uh, Patrick Holmes, actually, how about this? This is ESPN's ADP. And the, I remind people all the time, this stuff is subject to change. But right now it's number one amongst quarterbacks, 28.3 overall. That's oh, insane. Oh, so he, he's number one on the C, big C. There has not been one. There's not been one projection where I've seen him, I think, in anybody's top three. He's not. Two things can be true at once. Patrick Mahomes would be the best player on the planet by a long shot right now. Well, and right, taking right, him ahead I, of Josh right. Allen is completely insane. Which, yeah, I don't want to uh, relitigate the NFL top 100 as one of the no. players. But, uh, <laughs> yeah, Mahomes at going first ahead of Josh Allen. Like, again, just... Yeah, we, we're like, on the same page. With it's that nuts. One. I, yeah. I guess I felt like I was seeing his projections yeah, lower. His ranking is lower than that. Like he right. is a fairly frequent quarterback four, quarterback five, maybe even quarterback six for people that are CJ Stroud and Anthony Richardson optimist. It's insane is, though. Is that Mahomes. a multi-year thing though? Because I mean, the argument for Mahomes is he just yeah. came off arguably his worst statistical season that he's ever had. I mean, yeah. the QBR is the worst of his career. Right. The yardage is the second lowest. His touchdowns are the second lowest and yep. the second lowest to a season where well, I think he was at 27 touchdowns and I still think he only had like five picks and last year's double digit picks. It feels like even though we are all on the same page about who he is and how horrifying he is and if you just pick the Chiefs for the next five years, I'm not going to tell you you're wrong, but I'd say statistically in relation to what we're actually talking about, this is the worst he's ever played. Yeah, it really was. So he had three games last year, amazingly, with 20 plus fantasy points in 2023, which tracks based off of how frustrating what was 20, last year. Can you look up 22? Yeah. So going back in the, the starter, the seasons he was a starter for a full-time mm -hmm. basis, three last year, prior years, 12, 12, 13. See? Yeah, six, which that was a year in which he missed three games. He got hurt early against Denver on a Thursday night. So only six, but you know, not great, but still. 12, 12, 13, six, and 13 is the five years prior to last season. So, uh, you know, not to make this, um, not to like make these players like faceless and anonymous, but you're, you're betting on, you're betting on repeatable acts in fantasy football and you're sort of like hedging against extremes. And the extremes suggest that Patrick Mahomes having the year he did last year is very unlikely. Like he's, he's too good. And if you, if it was like just a fantasy football playoffs, a fantasy football game pertaining to the playoffs, like they looked a little closer to what we think they'll be in the playoffs, which is part of the reason why they won. Again, they've reloaded. Um, it feels like there's a weird pressure taking off Kansas City this year because they just proved they can do it without being this elite offense. Very optimistic about Mahomes having just a ridiculous season once again. All right, we've got a bunch of stuff here and only a few more minutes, so let's try to run through it. If I'm punting on a quarterback, if I'm going yep. like, look, I need a top guy and I want to try to get one of those top five tight ends, Give me some names. Give me three names. Yes, there's an awesome second-tier quarterback. Dak, who's going in the eighth round right now on ESPN, who's been a top-eight quarterback for the past five seasons. Uh, I would argue that Kyler Murray is in that category as well. Again, not trying to sit here and debate Kyler's like you know overall rank uh, in real-life terms, but the guy is an awesome fantasy quarterback and is in a good system for him. 
Brock Purdy, who maybe doesn't have quite as much upside every single week because he doesn't really run, but Brock Purdy plays in an amazing system for fantasy points. Jaden Daniels is a wild card. He's the most interesting one. I know I don't have to tell you about the brilliance of Jaden Daniels last season. Um, athletically, though, you just don't see players come around like that at that quarterback spot all that often. He is going super late, too. His name might push him up the board to be closer and closer to drafts, but you could wait to like the 10th round and get Jaden Daniels. Jordan Love in that same category, too. So that's a lot of names. The point is, there's nothing wrong with Josh Allen early, Jalen Hurts early, but if you decide to wait, you're in a good spot. Top five tight ends scoring last year, Laporta, Ingram, Kelsey, yeah. Hawkinson, and then Kittle. Um, I'm going to throw one at you. And it wasn't like, I think he was still 10th in scoring, but Dalton Kincaid. He had only yeah. two two touchdowns, but he had 91 targets. It's a rook, and it's again, it's a carryover of loving him in college. But I would think as you look at the depth chart of receiver and a lot of hope for Keon Coleman, I would be surprised if Kincaid is not a more targeted player and somebody that ends up in the end zone a lot more to even creep up into that top five scoring. Totally. One of the better uh, breakout picks for this season. And while uh, Keon Coleman, you know, obviously was taken with a first pick of the second round, um, you know, player I liked in college has some, some real obvious strengths and some limitations, which is why he went in the second round. Um, as much as there's excitement around surrounding him, as I think more and more, or as I thought more and more about the Bills' plans this offseason, like they traded Stephon Diggs. Like they made, they, they, they willingly had to agree to make that move. They allowed Gabe Davis, which I thought was a good business move, to walk away. Um, allow him to go to Jacksonville for three years, 39 million bucks. I think the Bills are saying to themselves, it's less about like which wide receiver that we acquired steps up. I think it's more about the belief that Tulsa Kincaid can become a major dude. And also Khalil Shakir, who, you know, a guy that has had some bright moments for them, I think will play a bigger role than maybe he is currently forecasted to play maybe outside of Buffalo. It seems like there's a lot of momentum and support for him amongst the local beat. But Buffalo's answer might just be that, like, we don't need a true number one wide receiver. We just need a bunch of really solid players. And maybe the best out of those solid players is Dalton Kincaid. Okay. Um, give me uh, a few sleepers in general. And then I have one last question. I actually did. I, I put together a full list of one from every single team. Uh, here's, let me just, it's not a qualifier. It's just like for if, if you're all out there 32? listening and you're like, yeah, we were thinking about doing something for, uh, for our show in the next few days here. Uh, sleepers are no longer names of players that you've never heard of, right? Like it's not guys that you have been, wow, like I've, <laughs> I've, I've never, you know, like that used to be a thing when I was growing up. It'd be like, you know, the Saints third wide out where you're like, wait, never heard of that guy. Let me go check them out. It's guys that you've heard of. It's also just that they're being drafted really low. Michael Wilson in Arizona is a name that a guy that I think is going to be a good player. I think Dylan Lobby uh, from uh, University of New Hampshire, now with the Raiders, is going to play a bigger role than people realize. And that's like a good deep cut right there. Like you might Here be familiar go. with him of the obviously our roots uh, from you know same home state, uh, but also like a guy that I think is going to have a legit role uh, pretty soon. Tyrone Tracy from, uh, from the, the giants also should, you know, could have a legit role there with Devin Singletary as the guy, uh, a name people probably already know, like Josh Downs from the Colts is kind of not being talked about right now. And he was a real factor for them last season. He had like a stretch of seeing like eight targets a game for a while. And it seems like he's the number two, at least in my estimation there, which uh, if I'm optimistic about Anthony Richardson, it's not just because of the running. It has to be about some of the players around him as well. So those would be some names. And then Quarterback, again, everybody knows every quarterback, but Will Levis to me is the obvious. Like, if this guy takes a step, he's got so many of the ingredients to be a fantasy football star, even if he's not a perfect quarterback in real life. Dylan Lobby get a doctorate there at UNH or what? I think he, he was there for a long time, man. I think he's 24 already. Okay. Um, he was good, though. <laughs> he is. He Fun is player to watch. Yeah. Love his profile pick, though. That's right up there. I mean, that's oh right up there God. with the field. Yeah. That's like a Field Yates special right there, all yeah. neck. All oh, right. Yeah, last. Last thing, give me, um, because this is a, let me use an example first. Things that you're paying attention to. Okay, you're okay. a couple weeks in, things are falling apart, you've got the bad injury luck. But like when I look at Herbert and some of the rankings right now, it seems yeah. like everyone's scared off because of Harbaugh's approach to football. Like, yeah. oh, he's going to run, he's going to run. And and granted, the the turnover that we've seen at receiver as well, even though there was this time with the Chargers, I was just so in love with all of their skill guys. I know. Like even their yeah. fifth option in the passing game. I even started to choke up a little bit even thinking about it, but it just didn't work out for him. <laughs> um, but I, I heard you talk about, I've heard others talk about this, like this is actually being oversold now because even if you're the most run-happy offense in the NFL, Baltimore last year ran it more than anybody else, just a hair under 50% of their plays. Like nobody's yeah. going to come into this 
going, you know, Nebraska in the 90s on totally. this in today's NFL. I mean, Cincinnati barely runs the football. Kansas City, I, they're like, you know, 40% running the football. But even last year, and that's because of Lamar that you have Baltimore. It just basically every other play is a rushing play, and maybe they creep up. But I feel like it's – I know that it's, it's, it's more than that and the draft pick not working out, all this kind of stuff. But that's something I would look at where I'm going to watch the game and go, maybe Herber is completely overlooked here because he's still, I think, a top five talent in the position. Give me something that you're thinking about. Yeah, so he's like he, – he just has nuclear ability that it's like, wow, if Justin Herber just plays off the charts, like nobody was – and the, the narrative has changed now, but nobody was sitting here last year like – CJ Stroud is loaded with weapons around him, right? Like prior to last season, Nico no. Collins had never had 500 yards in a season, much less what he did during the 2023 year. So I do think it's important for us to remember that like a lot of times, like a, a, a freak quarterback can overcome the situation around him. That'd be a good example. I would say right now, like something that I am monitoring is the backs that I don't feel crazy inspired about as the starter, who are more the starter by default than they are, I think, like by ability, and what, if any, indicators we're getting about the players right behind them. So I'll give you a few examples. Uh, Zamir White in in, La- in Las Vegas. Like, I think he's a fine player. I don't think he's like a clear-cut, indisputable, like has to be the number one guy for the Raiders for the full season. I mentioned Zach Moss earlier for the Bengals. Could Chase Brown, who I liked coming into the draft last year out of Illinois, ends up dropping to the uh, sixth round. Um, like that's a, I think a capable enough back backup where you're like, all right, Hey, so, uh, and the, the, the analogy that I'll draw to last year was Alexander Madison, who everybody was like, yeah, he's the guy now, right? Like Minnesota, like kept him. Uh, by the way, I am including myself in this, in this conversation. Uh, they let Dalvin cook walk and I kept being like, yeah, you know, they gave him real money. And then it was like, wait, they gave him two years and 7 million bucks. Like, I mean, more than yeah. nothing. Right. But like, Two years, seven million dollars is not like enough. Like they're not they're not putting him on scholarship at that level, right? Like they're not required to make a man the entire season, and he ended up having a very mediocre year, especially relative to expectations. So I'm keeping my eyes on the guys that I'm not totally sold. Like in an all things being equal world, would be starting running backs and how the backups are either looking slat or like if if there's at least a clear cut number two. If it's like he got three guys behind him, I'm a little bit less interested. That is Field Yates. Uh, it's great to catch up again. I the Fantasy you. Focus podcast, uh, and you guys, you guys go five days a week. Five days a week, man. A lot of content. A lot of content. A lot of content. Yeah. Big numbers. I remember looking at the charts and looking at the numbers in the fall. I'd be like, "Damn it, they're smoking me." <laughs> Come on, you're an institution. <laughs> you're an institution. You don't have to worry about the numbers. Uh, thanks, my man. Appreciate you. <laughs>